So welcome to all who are participating in worship this morning, both those who are gathered in the sanctuary and those of you who are gathering online. Um, I think you're being tech hosted this morning by, by Margaret. So thank you, Margaret from Manitoba, who will be looking after the tech this morning if anybody has any issues there. The prelude and the announcement slides are going to begin in less than one moment, and then worship itself will begin at the top of the hour. So welcome, everybody.
So good morning to everybody. Good Sunday morning to you as we all gather on site and online for this, the sixth Sunday in the Easter season. And here in this part of the world, at least, it is a long weekend, either celebrating patriots or a, a queen. Uh, it's also a long weekend Sunday where a whole bunch of this church is celebrating their birthdays. Happy circumnavigation of the sun to you and anniversaries and opening up the gardens and so on. So it's lovely to see you all here. You are worshiping with the community of Cedar Park United Church, which is an LGBTQ plus affirming ministry of the United Church of Canada. And it's good. It's uh, after two years, every Sunday where I come back in here, it just feels good to be here and to be able to share this with people all over the world, to come together for spiritual nourishment for the living of these strange days. This Sunday, I said it was the sixth Sunday, but I'm stepping out of sync with the lectionary to reflect with you on a feast day that is more celebrated in Orthodox, Eastern, and Catholic traditions, but it's still on our calendar. It's known as the Ascension of Jesus. More on that later. But before we begin our worship, we're going to take this first moment as one of gratitude and respect that we give to the ancient keepers of the land upon which our homes and our church buildings sit. The lands and the waterways here are more ancient and diverse than our imaginations can fathom. And they've sustained indigenous communities of the Ganyangahaga, the Anishinaabeg, and the Abenaki peoples for thousands of years before the arrival of settler peoples and successive waves of people coming here to seek safety, refuge, or opportunity. And for those of you who are worshiping with us in homes in Manitoba or British Columbia or Ontario or Melbourne, Australia or South Africa or the East Midlands or the Welsh towns of the UK, I invite all of you also to recall those who settled the lands that you call home. We do this because we also acknowledge how much we have failed to recognize the dignity, the humanity, the cultures, the religions, the customs of indigenous peoples, and indeed the customs of any who have come to these shores. So as a faith community, each week we take this moment to recommit ourselves to becoming people of God's dream, workers for a world at peace with itself, seekers of peace and justice, not only for all people, but for all creation. So let us begin. In the name of God, grace and peace be with you. And let us center ourselves for worship with our minds and our bodies. And I invite you first to put both your feet onto the ground This one single planet Earth that is home to us all and unites us all, kindred earthlings. But also this act of putting our feet to ground us into this time and this place together. Now I invite you to take your hands and hold them for a moment like an empty vessel. An empty vessel that we trust that by the grace of God will be filled with the blessings that we need for the living of this day, not only for ourselves, but with all with whom we can share these blessings. we breathe. We take deep breaths into our body, becoming aware of how much a simple breath replenishes and renews us. And as we breathe out, 
we feel what it's like to release and let go, to make room for new beginnings. So let's breathe in and out. And a hand over our hearts so we can feel that beat beneath our hands, beneath our ribs. And let it be for us an echo of the heartbeat of God. The one who creates and sustains all living creatures, all beings, including us. And clearing our minds of the many distractions and to-do lists we have for today so that we can be present to one another in this moment. We open our eyes, we look at the light around us, and we invite those in their homes to join with us as we light our Christ candle. Reminding us that we call Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Thanks, Rod. So we're going to join in together with the call to worship, and Rod is going to be the leader of the congregation here and online Say, speaking the bold words that you'll see on the screen. And as I said to Rod, he's the boss, follow him. We are called to worship in the name of the risen Christ because we trust that what Jesus began by the lakeshore of Galilee continues by this lakeshore in Quebec and in the neighborhoods and workplaces and homes of each and every one of us. We gather in worship to hear God's story told again. We gather to find our place within the grand narrative of God's healing, redeeming love for all creation. We gather to look up to the heavens in prayer so that we can disperse to share God's blessings on earth. Let us gather, let us worship, let us pray, let us sing, for God, For God begins, begins a new thing in us today.
That sounds like a call to arms, that does, doesn't it? Letting music fill this place once again, it would be wonderful. Great memories on the screen. So normally for the call, uh, sorry, for the prayer for gathering, I have written something and it sounds all quiet and meditative and what have you, but um, I wanted to get you involved in this gathering prayer this morning because liturgy, worship, is the work of the people, so you have some work to do. <laughs> anyway, let me set this up. Most of you know I went to England last week and the week before, and when I left Montreal, there were hardly any leaves out on the trees, and the daffodils were only just coming into bloom. So it was an overnight flight. I wake up in the morning, I get off the plane, I get to, onto the uh, underground, except the underground from Heathrow isn't underground all the way. Part of it is above ground. And I was shocked to see trees in full leaf and all the hawthorns in blossom and the cherries in blossom. It was amazing to go from sort of a hanging on winter here to full-blown early summer in six hours. Then it got even weirder because I took the train north from Heathrow up to Manchester, and it was like traveling back in time. Trees in full leaf and bloom and lambs in the fields that were almost as big as their mothers. Top picture of the sheep. That's what I saw in the home counties around London, but as I traveled successively further north, the sheep were only just newborn, and they were all gangly and knock-kneed, and all of the blossoms weren't even yet out. The only thing that we saw, Norman, right, was the bog grass up on the moors. So it got me to thinking how life itself is just such a miracle of newness, and we take it for granted until we have a, an opportunity like that. So that's what I'm giving you now, an opportunity to think about how we are woken up, if we're aware of it, to God going, behold, I do a new thing. So that's the prayer. We put that up on the screen, and we're going to start with that with that bit in bold, and there's some ideas up there, and you can say those out loud. I've got this sort of a little bit back to front. If there's anything up there that you want to say, say it. It won't be orderly. It will be just like a riotous spring, right? And if there's something that's not up there, speak up, speak out, and I'll maybe be able to repeat it. So let's say the first bit together. Holy One, you surprise us with new things every day. Somebody said fresh coffee. Hot tea. Cherries. Say that again, Lisa, would you? You like the one about dogs wagging their tails, right, yeah. How many of you were woken up to a cat licking you with that raspy tongue? One of them. Cardinal birds in the garden calling out to their mates, or the blue jay going nuts, or the pileated woodpecker going rat-a-tat-tat on your chimney. Anything else? Grandchildren bursting with life, great. Absolutely. It really has been sort of almost revolution, not evolution, the way that spring has sprung. Clouds in the sky, yep. A thunderstorm that missed us. Also pretty amazing, yeah. Birds in nests, yeah. Isn't it amazing when we stop and think? how much it is, so let's say the end together. Behold, we say to one another, behold, God makes all things new. Thanks be to you, great God. Amen. And with that, Martha, I think you have got a crew to plot with today, don't you? So we will let you folk leave. And as you leave, you can hit the music and we can join in. 
Let's turn the mic on too. There we go. Let us turn to our scriptures. And as I intimated at the beginning, we in the United Church of Canada rarely gather for worship outside of a Sunday morning. Our three exceptions, Christmas, Easter, count those as one, weddings, Rarely these days, but weddings and funerals. Those are about the only things that we would gather for worship. That means that we, unlike other traditions, Christian traditions, don't gather on the 26th of May this year, which is a Thursday, and also Bob Bernie's birthday, but we don't gather to celebrate the Ascension, which means most of us have never heard the texts I'm going to read this morning. Now, sometime back in March, when I was looking at the large blank planning worship screen, I thought, well, it's a long weekend, let's do a bit of time travel, and we'll, we'll play around with the stories of the Ascension. I thought it was a good idea. But when I started seriously to look at the texts, I broke out in a little bit of a cold sweat. What am I supposed to do with these, with you folk, I asked myself. So I read, and I reread, and I ended up with these words on the page. Hercules, Star Wars, the ozone layer, and the ascension of Jesus. I'm not sure I'm going to make a whole lot more sense of it than that, but we'll see. We'll get there. So we are going to encounter these texts, trusting that even in these weird ones, the Holy Spirit will breathe life and inspiration into our lives. So the two texts are both written by Luke. Luke being the person who wrote the gospel of that name, but he also wrote Luke 2, which you all know as the Acts of the Apostles, right? So it was the sequel. So what's fascinating, all of you folk who've joined me for Midrash, is that Luke tells the same story twice, and in a slightly different way, he turns it so that we can see it from a different perspective. So, beginning with the gospel, these are the closing words of the final chapter of the movie Luke 1. As they say, as we say here, a story, a story. All right. So, after Jesus had journeyed with Cleopas and his companion along the road to Emmaus, after he had broken bread with them and then vanished from their sight, after the disciples gathered in Jerusalem to marvel at all of this, while they were doing that, Jesus suddenly came in and stood among them. And they were rightly terrified, convinced that they were seeing a ghost. But Jesus stood there and told them to touch, to see, and he even ate fish with them. And then he said to them, do you see now how everything that I taught you, everything written in Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, how it's all been fulfilled? And he taught them how to read and understand the scriptures, concluding by saying, you all are witnesses to these things and more. I shall send upon you that which God my Father has promised. 
So now then, stay here in the city until you have been endowed with power from on high. And then, leading them a short walk out of the city to Bethany, which is in the Mount of Olives, he raised his hands in blessing. And as he did so, he was carried up into heaven. And the disciples worshipped. And then they returned to Jerusalem, filled with joy, and there they could be found daily praying in the temple. So that's Luke's first version. Now we pick up the second volume and read the very first verses of the book of Acts. Luke writes, In the first book, Theophilus, which means God-lover, I wrote all about Jesus, what he did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after having given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering and death, he had presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them throughout 40 days and teaching them about the kingdom, the dream of God. He also told them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father to be fulfilled. While he was still with them, they asked him, Rabbi, Lord, is it now? Is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? His response was clear. It's not given to you to know what God will or will not do. Instead, what you do need to know is that you will receive power to become witnesses, testifiers in Jerusalem, in all Judea, even in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it was then, as he said this, as they were watching, that he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight, While they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two beings in white robes stood beside the disciples and asked them, Galileans, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven, he's going to come again in the same way you saw him go. Then they returned to the city. And they went to the upper room where they were staying, and there, along with the women who had accompanied Jesus and with Jesus' brothers, the disciples were united in their devotion to prayer as they waited, as they waited. This is the witness of the early church. Would you pray with me? As we encounter this strange story, may we find in it truth, wisdom, things to ponder. More importantly, may we find in it the courage to trust the truth of these words. Amen. My notes here begin with a rhetorical question to which I know the answer, but that's a rhetorical thing to do, isn't it? Are there stories in Scripture that baffle you or alarm you or mystify you or confuse you? You may put your hands up now. (laughs) I think all of us have at least one of those stories, if not many, if not all of them. And this, for me, obviously, is one of them, or two of them. Luke's double, insistent telling of this bodily ascension of Jesus 40 days after what was already a baffling resurrection. What is it confusing and perturbing or whatever about this is if you look to the other Gospels to say, okay, so what did they say about it? Mark, zip, nada, nothing. Matthew, also, who usually likes to have a bit of pomp and circumstance, also nothing. So then we go to John, 
which is a bit of a mystical uh, marathon. And John has his Jesus saying mystifying things about being exalted. And then we have that very sort of human moment in the morning of the ascension where he tells Mary Magdalene not to touch him, quote, because he'd not yet ascended to his father. That's all we got. So Mary Magdalene nods like we would, pretending to understand and moving on to the next topic. So it begs the question, what is the point that Luke is trying to make with this enigmatic upward departure of an already resurrected Jesus? When you ask a question like that, it's usually followed by this one. What crisis or burning question was he supposedly addressing when he tells this story? Because that's what we do, isn't it? Something perturbs us or somebody, something perturbs a child or a grandchild, and we say, listen, let me tell you a story. So maybe that's what Luke is doing. So what was the burning question then? And another question, do we even have a burning question about this text? I do, because I'm a Bible nerd, but there we go. So the answer to the first question, what burning question was he supposedly addressing? I started to look beyond in the Gospels, then I kept looking further and further out, and I discovered, for example, that ascensions, ascensions of mortals to the realm of God or to the gods is not an uncommon narrative in the surrounding religions of Mesopotamia and in Greco-Roman cosmology. This is where Hercules comes in. Because Hercules, who was a son of Zeus, he ascended. So did Romulus, the founder of Rome. And not to be left out, so did Jesus' contemporary, Augustus. Around the religions of that Babylonian, uh, Mesopotamian area, the Sumerian son of the god Ea did it too. And if you jump forward a few centuries, the Quran speaks about Abraham. We know who Abraham is. And Abraham in the Quran gets the return ticket to heaven and back for the express purpose of assuring humans that the seven heavens of Allah do indeed exist. In the Bible, we've got older stories, too, of Enoch. I have no idea why Enoch was ascended into heaven, but he's there in Scripture, and the same with Elijah. Human bodies swept up into the heavens. So if you start to look at all of those, we begin to realize that maybe one of the key reasons for these stories is to accentuate the exceptional closeness of that particular human being to the source of power, the source of divine power. So if you want, it's effectively putting these particular humans at the top of the spiritual hierarchy. So if one of Luke's critical reasons for writing about this son of God ascending is to say this guy is special, he's also doing it as a counter-narrative to Augustus. The supposed divinity of Augustus is contrasted with the, in Luke's words, the true divinity or the true holiness of Jesus. So, one other reason, very practical, those of you who are pragmatic, it serves to explain why when you do your pilgrimages to the Holy Land, there is no tomb of Jesus. He didn't need one. His body ascended into heaven. So that's a pretty good reason, too. That was then. This is now. In a scientific age where the flat earth, dome of heaven on top, image of the earth-centric cosmology that looks a little bit like that, <laughs> is only still believed by a handful of biblical literalists who say if you'd stop believing that, then the whole thing goes kathlui. So... We also know that the only holes in Earth's atmosphere, 
this is where the ozone holes come in, are created not by ascending holy men bursting through, but by us, we humans, with our devilish concoctions of CFCs and HCFCs and overheating carbon emissions. Q. So, does this weird story, this ascension, really matter to the way that we, followers of Jesus, try to live the dream of God in 2022? Is this story the key theological pivot upon which we base our whole faith and discipleship? If you're all shaking your head, I would agree with you, but, 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 but then turn it a little. Maybe there's something to it. Because if we leave aside Hercules, if we leave aside something I didn't say earlier, but, you know, the beam me up Scotty type image of Jesus, if we leave aside Star Trek, and even if we leave aside the ozone layer for a minute, Luke, in these two stories, shifts our attention from Jesus' disappearing feet. Salvador Dali's picture of the ascension, 1958, shifts from that to the promise of a power that will overshadow all, to quote Luke. If any of you were with us in Advent, you heard the same phrase at the beginning of Luke's gospel when the Holy Spirit overshadowed a young girl called Mary. So we are talking about God's creative power, and what Luke is trying to do is say, stop looking at the feet. You are going to receive the same creative power. That's what this story is about. That's us. You know I can't resist. The force, Luke, the gospeler names as the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad you were here, Dan, this morning. I wrote this next section just for you. You know where I'm going. The force that George Lucas, Luke, interestingly, portrays in his Star Wars sagas is also mysterious, right? It's intangible. It's invisible, except in the way that you see its effects through those who are endowed with the force. So in Star Wars, as well as the gospel, in these opening verses of Acts, the force in creation seems to find its way to the margins, to the tiny, to the beleaguered, to the ragtag. So up against seemingly indomitable opposing imperial forces, whether that's the empire of Rome or the empire of Palpatine, this force, this potency for good, for truth, for loving, for compassion, for justice, and for liberating is constantly at work. Not to amass power for itself, or power over, but simply, if you look at it, to create space for God's creative diversity. So the true impact, I think, of this ascension story as it pivots Luke's narrative from the acts of Jesus to the acts of those who follow is that we hear that we have to wait and learn just like Luke Skywalker, to feel the force of God's Holy Spirit, this force that endows us and empowers us to live God's dream amidst the competing forces of our own world. Now, if that sounds spooky and you think you're going to end up with a halo or something like that, the word that comes to my mind is courage. Courage doesn't eliminate fear, does it? It takes a hold of fear, and it takes a hold of your breath, and it says, we know this is going to hurt, but let's try it anyway. So Luke's version of Star Wars, with his CGI special effects of Jesus going up into heaven with clouds and angelic messengers, 
is all his way of saying that we who take up Jesus' mantle, who take on this task of compassion and care, we who are called especially right now to hold out hope for the hopeless, we who are called to bind up broken hearts, grieving hearts, we who are being called right now to give shelter to those whose homes have been bombed out or thunderstormed out, and we who are called to declare to the despairing that this world is worthy of God's recreative healing mending. We get to remember that we don't do it in our own strength, but we do it because of this promised power of God, this force. So don't look up. I think that's another movie, isn't it? My goodness, I haven't watched that one yet, so I have nothing to say about that. But that's what those two beings say to the disciples, isn't it? Don't look up. Stop looking to a heaven beyond the clouds. Stop looking for Christ beyond yourselves. But instead, through prayer, vigil, waiting, gathering in worship, feel, sense the power of God's self overshadowing us so that we can live courageously. So don't look up. Watch the news. Look around you. See the force. And if the news doesn't tell you of the force in action, be the news. Feel this Holy Spirit overshadowing with courage those of us who dare to defy autocratic forces. Look around you here and where you are, for communities of hope and resistance, in church halls, in underground platforms, people healing and mending despite the worst the world can throw at us from Mariupol to Montreal. And last one, don't look up, look in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, when you get home tonight, when you're cleaning your teeth, I hope you will remember this. That is the face of the one upon whom God sends the power of the Holy Spirit to change the world. And none of you are missed out. Feel the force, Luke says. Amen. Let's stand and sing it this time. Thank you. You can be seated. This is one of those invisible moments, right? You know, we used to pass the wooden plates. That's, that's gone with COVID. But it is a time for us to just give ourselves a chance to reflect on what we've heard and to think how it is that we reflect God's creative energy in the world through the things that we do to support the ministries of this church, the things that you do in your daily lives to support hope, dignity, life, well-being. So let's take a full, if I add up, it's probably about 40 seconds. There are different slides that are on there. And then I'll end with a prayer of dedication of our offering to God.
Let's pray. It's daunting, Holy One, for us to be so integral to the living out of your dream on this earth. So these gifts that we give you, the time, the skills, the money that we give this church and other organizations whose work heals, restores, forgives, gives hope, we dedicate it all to you so that your Holy Spirit, the force of your loving, will transform them and more importantly transform us into people of courage and compassion, people of integrity, love, and hope. This we pray, inheritors of the blessing of your Son, crucified, risen, and ascended. Amen. So for our prayers of the people today, because it's ascension, and because we seem to light candles in our church a little bit, I'm giving you the chance in our prayers. The beginning part of the prayer, um, it leads to an invitation where if you would like, I'll see if I can do this myself now to show you. No. Come on, come on. Stand close enough and you will see the breeze taking up. So you're invited to come forward, take one of these tapers, light it, and then blow it out, which means you'll have to sneak your mask down for a minute. And then just stand and watch your flame smoke drift up and let that be your personal prayer. So that we will do in a few moments. I now need to light one so that you guys can light it. Let's pray. Holiest of all that is holy, this thing we do, praying, speaking words, heaving sighs, shedding tears, smiles of gratitude, wide eyes of wonder, the distortions of anguish on our face and heart, they're all sent out from within our mortal frame to we know not where, but we address them to you. You, the source and our end. You, the lover and the beloved. You, the giver and the gift. Do our prayers leak through tiny gaps in earth's ozone sheath and soar among the stars and mingle in the clouds of Andromeda and spin circles around Saturn? Do they rise like smoke from a candle flame, from incense? Do they rise like morning mist off the lake do they burn in the heat of the sun? Do they enfold themselves into the cracks in the walls that divide us from one another? It's no matter. For this we trust. That all the love, the feeling, the pain, the promise, everything we send to you is enfolded into the vast infinity of your curious and caring heart. And so we pray, we light a candle. And snuff the candle. And watch our prayers rise into creation's embrace. And I invite any of you who want to do that to come forward and do so. Give yourselves enough space so that when you're blowing, not blowing at each other.
We name aloud into these ascending prayers those who have asked us to pray with them and for them. For Peggy, Anne-Marie, Laura, Brendan, Audrey, Shelley, Linda, Leanne, Libby, Susan, Mike, Tim, Austin, Ian, Jessica. We pray for those we don't name, youth and young adults whose struggle for mental well-being is hard, long work. We pray for those who are in the midst of relationship turmoil and family crisis. And we pray for ourselves. We pray, longing for the overshadowing of your Holy Spirit, Holy One, overshadowing with hope and trust and courage. And as we do, we find the words turned again in different ways that have been spoken by people in all times and all places who have called upon God as a mother who loves us. And today we use this paraphrase by Lalo Winkley. God, lover of us all, most holy one, help us to respond to you, to create what you want for all here on earth. Give us today enough for our needs. Forgive our weak and deliberate offenses, just as we must forgive others when they hurt us. Help us to resist evil and to do what is good, for we are yours, endowed with your power to make our world whole. Amen. So thank you, every one of you, for coming and choosing to spend your time in worship today, whether it's online or whether it is gathered as a community here. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, it takes a village to make worship that reaches worldwide. And so my thanks for the people two weeks ago who ran worship on the 8th, and to Alison Huntley, who led worship last Sunday, and which I watched on my phone in Macclesfield. So thank you to all of those people for doing that. Also, um, for those of you who are worshiping on site, I would love to not jump on two people as they walk into church every morning, but to create a roster of people who can do the voicing of the congregation. You'll always get the script ahead of time maybe a little bit more ahead of time if you can sign up. So either see me afterwards if you've got a Sunday between now and the 26th of June when you can help, or go to uh, the sign-up schedule, check your Friday update, and that will get you to the right place. Also, looking up there, um, it takes a team to make the live stream work too, uh, including Margaret, who's tech hosting in Manitoba. But if there are any of you who would like to um, learn how to do some of the stuff up there. I think they will tell you it's the best view in the house up there. So, and I'm pretty sure that you actually have a little stash of little chocolates up in the corner. So, um, just, you know, just a bit of enticement to get you to ascend on high. Um, anyhow, so just pointing that out to anybody who is joining in worship right now. Next week, we gather here and online in hybrid fashion for the seventh Sunday of the Easter season and then look forward two weeks hence to the fantastic celebration of Pentecost, where we will also celebrate communion that Sunday. So that's on June the 4th. Back to today, after the blessing, you'll get to enjoy Douglas at the piano, that piece you played this morning. I'm really glad your fingers were awake. It's pretty impressive. So... More of that to come as we watch the news and announcements of a community living God's dream. 
Now let us prepare to go into our world and our worship with song and then with blessing. And with this song, I know you have your masks on, but sing. We are called to be disciples. Let's sing. Dick, to help us, let us send one another out. Let us go into this day alert for God's creative and redemptive presence in the world. Let us go, go into, into this, this world, world ready, ready to, to live, live the, the gospel, gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ in our daily encounters. Endeavors. And let us live expectant for God's Holy Spirit to guide and empower us. We, we shall, shall go, go out, out with, with joy as messengers of peace. For God goes with us. Alleluia. Amen. Please be seated. 